Back in the day when my girls were born, it was not easy to share photos and videos with loved ones, but you have a fantastic option available, the Family Album app. The Family Album app was created in 2015 and has operated in the long term to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's a totally secure personal haven for your family's memories. I love that there's no third party ads, no unwanted eyes. Now let me share some of the great features that make the Family Album app a go-to app. First off, the app automatically sorts photos and videos by month, allowing you to swipe back in time and see how your child has grown. No more scrolling through endless feeds or searching through folders. Another cool feature about the Family Album app is you can order eight free photo prints every month to be delivered to your home. It's really nice to have some tangible pictures to hold on to or share to document each month of your baby's life. Plus, the Family Album app has unlimited storage and it is totally free. Yes, you heard that right. No more worrying about running out of space or being bombarded by ads when you're just trying to relive those heartwarming moments. So if you are still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it is time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, it's all one word, download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is a pediatrician approved skin protectant free of dyes, preservatives and zinc oxide. It was developed by a mom who is also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. Diaper rash can be one of the worst experiences your little one has to go through and keeping their delicate skin happy and healthy shouldn't require a spatula to apply thick, gooby treatments that can be just as irritating and uncomfortable as the diaper rash itself. Use just a small amount of Dr. Mom Butt Balm to help soothe your baby's skin and feel good about making the right choice. Dr. Mom is committed to providing an ultra premium formula for moms who will not settle when it comes to their little ones. Help your baby feel better and get relief from irritating diaper rash with simple quality ingredients, no artificial dyes or preservatives, so it's gentle on your baby's delicate skin. Head to Amazon.com or Walmart.com to grab Dr. Mom Butt Balm because nothing comes between you and your baby, especially not diaper rash. In this birth story episode from Jody, she shares what it's like to give birth under circumstances where you don't have a lot of options available to you. I have to say that this was a difficult story for me to hear. Welcome to the All About Pregnancy and Birth podcast. If you're having a baby in the hospital, you are giving birth in a system that too often takes away power from women over what happens in their own bodies. I'm Dr. Nicole Calloway Rankins, a practicing board certified OBGYN, who's had the privilege of helping well over a thousand babies into this world. I've been a doctor for over 20 years, and I'm here to help you take back your power, advocate for yourself, and have the beautiful pregnancy and birth that you deserve. This podcast is for educational purposes only, and it's not a substitute for medical advice. Check out the full disclaimer at drnicolerankins.com forward slash disclaimer. Now let's get to it. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. This is episode number 258. Whether it is your first time listening or you have been here before, I am so grateful that you are spending some of your time with me today. Jody is a relatively new registered nurse. She started her career in the spring of 2020 during the height of COVID. Her first nursing job was on a medical surgical floor at the one and only acute care hospital on Maui, where she stayed for just over a year before making the transition to working for a local nonprofit hospice agency, where she has been ever since. Jody has lived on Maui for 18 years in a small town called Lahaina. You may recognize that as it was in the news recently for the devastating wildfire that took place there on August 8th. 2023. 
Now, Jody listened to many, many birth stories on this podcast, and she would hear that for many parents, selecting the hospital where they choose to give birth was an important part of their birth plan. But for her, she lives on a small island with only one hospital that's over an hour drive. So for her, she had this element of not being able to control that aspect of her birth, and she had to accept that she would not have certain options that were available to her that are often available at larger hospitals. She did have a birth plan, but she never anticipated that her labor would progress so quickly. And even though she wanted to avoid an episiotomy or any type of assistance to bring her birth, all of that went out of the window when her baby was in distress and her baby had to get here quickly. She ended up having an episiotomy and a forceps and vacuum birth with no pain medication. And then after birth, her placenta had to be removed by hand manually in pieces, and that took over an hour. And again, that was also without pain medication. This was a very hard story for me to hear that she had to endure so much without pain medication because it really doesn't have to be that way. However, Jody felt that because she went into her birth with an understanding that things may not progress according to her plan, and she gave herself permission to accept interventions that she may not have anticipated wanting or needed, that helped her to remain pretty calm and focused during what was a difficult vaginal birth. I promise you, you are going to learn so much from Jody's story today. Now, Jody mentioned that she had a birth plan and I would like to invite you to come make a birth plan the right way in my live free class on May 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In it, we actually do talk about some of the things that can be done when you have limited options. So I highly encourage you to join the class. It's a fantastic class. Folks love it, love it, love it. And I love teaching it live. So join me on May 20th. You can register for the class at drnicolerankins.com forward slash birth plan. All right, let's get into the birth story with Jody. Thank you so much, Jody, for agreeing to come onto the podcast. I am excited to have you share your birth story today. Oh, thank you so much, Nicole. I'm I'm very happy to be here too. Yeah, so why don't you start off by telling us a bit about yourself and your family? Well, I am 39 years old, and I was 38 when I had my my son. He was my first and only baby right now. Um, he's now 15 months old. And so we live in Maui, Hawaii. We actually live in Lahaina, which mm. you guys, you know, some of the listeners might have remembered was in the news about six months ago because we had a really, really devastating wildfire here. Yeah. You know, we're we're fortunate in that our home was spared. We live about like eight to 10 miles from where the burn zone was, mm-hmm. but it um, it really just completely you know, destroyed our whole town, unfortunately. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, you know, um, my boyfriend and I, we've both lived here for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we've, you know, we've really made this our home. And like I said, we just have our one son. He's 15 months now. So he was born in November of 2023. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. And have, has the town started to recover from the wildfires? You know, it's really, it's going to be a very long, slow process. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, we just had the six month mark on February 8th mm-hmm. and really we only are in the very beginning of the cleanup phase. Mm. So I think for anything to actually be rebuilt could be many years down the road. Yeah. Some people are saying it could be anywhere from five to 10 years until the town is actually back to what, what it may, it, it'll never be back to what it was, sure, but sure. Yeah, yeah. Still a very ongoing struggle out here. Oh goodness. Goodness. Yeah. Um, well, if you have any resources or things where folks can help, then please feel free to share. I don't know if there are any organizations or things or, yeah. Um, do you know of anything? Um, I know the Lahaina Strong movement mm-hmm. um, is is a really good local uh, movement. I'm sure they have a presence. They do have a presence on social media on Facebook. So they're sharing, you know, the ongoing issues that are still coming up as far as housing, which is really the big one. I mean, mm-hmm. there's still lots of folks, thousands of people living in hotels at this point. Mm-hmm. No end in sight. So I think the Lahaina Strong movement would be a good one that people could could maybe look at and. 
see some issues. Okay. Well, we will put that link. We will put that link in our show notes. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear that you weren't affected um, yeah. by it. And I'm also glad, as I said, for you to come and share your birth story. Yes. So in order to understand what happens with the birth, we got to understand what happens with the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I think a little bit, your story also is important because you were in a little bit of an indifferent environment in terms of the choices that you had available yes. to you. So why don't you start off by telling us a bit about your pregnancy and your prenatal care? What was that like? Yeah. Um, you know, I had a pretty, I don't know, uneventful pregnancy. I feel mm-hmm. like I was pretty lucky um, as far as I didn't have any complications, you know, starting off first trimester. I had a little bit of and not even morning sickness, uh-huh. but just sort of ongoing. I would describe it as like car or motion sickness okay. throughout the throughout the day. Um, just feeling like generally really tired right. and just kind of that queasy feeling. Mm. Um, but I never threw up or I never had anything that was to that extent. Sure. So that was I was pretty fortunate in that. And then really once I hit my um, you know, the second trimester, I think I just had a lot of the normal discomfort, Mm -hmm. but nothing, nothing that wasn't tolerable. I was able to continue working the whole time. Um, And then fortunately with all my prenatal um, appointments, everything was normal. It was just a lot of the risk factors that go with being 38 and having it be my first pregnancy. You know, they really just put me into sort of a, I guess, a different level of care um, as far as being advanced maternal age. Sure. So, but other than that, um, you know, I really felt pretty good throughout okay. throughout most of my pregnancy. Okay. Okay. And are you were you otherwise healthy other than being advanced maternal age? Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't have any right. um, you know, any risk any other risk factors mm-hmm. or anything going on. It gotcha. was just just my age really. Okay. And do you do you, how do they make you feel, I should say, about <laughs> being <provide>. over 35? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it really depended. So I have Kaiser for insurance. Okay. They're like a large network out here. So uh-huh. I saw probably eight different doctors. Okay. Each appointment was somebody different. And so I never, you know, really built that great of a relationship with any one of the OBGYNs. Mm-hmm. It was just always somebody different. And of course I didn't know who was going to be on call, you know, that when it came time to deliver my son. So, you know, it was really, it was good that I got to see each of them. Some of them were very supportive and just, you know, don't mind the fact that you're over 35, Mm -hmm. just we're going to go by what you feel and and what's going on with the baby. And, and then others, I really felt like, especially when it got closer and I went to my final 40 week appointment, Mm -hmm. the doctor I saw for that visit, he really was pushing to induce me like that day. And it was all based on just my age. Okay. Okay. And it was even, I I remember I went to that visit the day before my due date Uh and he was like, he wanted me to go get induced that day, even though I wasn't Really, everything was fine. Right. There were no problems. I wasn't dilated. Right. There was no problems. Right. But again, he kept citing this one study, and I can't remember the name of the study, but uh-huh. there was something that he kept citing as the reason why I should go get induced. Like the ARRIVE trial, maybe? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. That was the one. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he even, <clears throat> I remember it's funny because it even got to the point where, you know, I told him during the visit that I was feeling good and, right. you know, I didn't want to get induced. I wanted to keep going. It wasn't even my due date. Right. And you could tell he was kind of half listening to me, but not really hearing me. Uh-huh. And then I, I got in the car and I drove away from my appointment and I'm feeling great and I'm just in a good mood. And he even called me as I'm driving away from the appointment just to say, I just want to check in one more time. You know, I'm going through your history and, you know, I really think that, you know, induction might be a good, you know, something that we should really, really consider. I'm like, did you just call me after we just went over this? Crazy. But he did. Yeah. So, I mean, how, well, what, what, what made you stand strong and say, no, thank you. Like, I'm not interested. Um, just, I mean, because I was feeling great Mm -hmm. still, Mm -hmm. um, I did, I I guess at that point I hadn't had any Braxton Hicks. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I had lost my mucus plug at that point, but he did do a a cervical check at that visit. I wasn't dilated. You know, my blood pressure was great. There was nothing, there were no concerns. And, you know, I really, you know, my birth plan, I knew I was going to have a hospital birth, Uh but, um, you know, I was really hoping for low to no interventions. Sure. 
And so I just, I had no problem really just telling him, no, I am a nurse, um, even though my world is not, you know, babies at all. Um, But I think just maybe having a little bit of that background going Uh through nursing school. Sure. um, I just felt like, no, I'm I'm good. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of nursing do you do? Um, right now I do hospice nursing. Oh, so I'm on the exact opposite end of the spectrum of the life spectrum. You are, you are on the exact opposite. All, all, um, very important work though. Yeah. And anybody who's called to do hospice work, I feel like is always special because it's a calling. I don't think that's something that you just yeah. kind of flippantly decide yeah. to do. So yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So what did you do to prepare for your birth? Um, I listened to a lot of birth stories <laughs> and I listened to your podcast a lot. Um, I came across your podcast. I think I was looking, I was listening to, I was listening to somebody else's podcast mm-hmm. that you were a guest on okay. actually. Okay. And so I just liked your approach to things. I felt like you offered both the, you know, sort of regular hospital route, mm-hmm. being a, being a background as an MD, but you also, you know, were open to hearing sort of, you know, the alternative side of things, Mm -hmm. you know, just, and where I felt like most podcasts were either one or the other, like either full home birth, Mm -hmm. you know, that whole route or full hospital wasn't like open to both. So, so I listened to your podcast a lot and birth stories. Um, and really that was mostly it. I thought about having a doula at one point, Uh but I just thought that I'd be able to, to do it on my own. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, what are some things that you wanted for your birth? Like I said, I knew I wanted to have a hospital birth. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to avoid a C-section, like, you know, I feel like a lot of mothers do. Um, I didn't want to have any pain meds if possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to be able to move around freely if possible. Right. But other than that, I was really open to just kind of seeing how it goes, how it went. Gotcha. And I think that actually helped me when it came time to give birth because things didn't go perfect as planned and they never do. Um, <laughs> or maybe they do sometimes, but often they might not. Yes. Um, and so I think that was actually helpful. And, you know, I remember at one point I was like, I don't really want an IV. I don't really want to have, you know, be connected to anything. And then one of my friends who works in labor and delivery, she's mm-hmm. like, you know, getting a little fluid sometimes is really not, not the worst thing when you're giving birth. Right. And I'm like, yeah, she's she might be right. right so right, I kind of right. was open to open to what would come. Okay, okay. So was there anything that you were scared or worried about? Honestly, a C section mm-hmm. was probably. I was really scared about that. Okay. Um, just the idea of having I don't know, just something about the possibility of a C section mm-hmm. was really what scared me more than like the pain of having a vaginal delivery without right. any pain medicine on board. Mm. Um, I don't know why. Gotcha. I mean, it's just, that's totally normal. I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a surgery. It's, yeah. a, it's, um, it's a big surgery. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's totally, totally normal to be, be concerned about it. Yeah. Oh, and I should ask, what did you do? How were you planning to manage pain? Like, did, were you going to do, like, what were your thoughts on, on that? Um, just breathing techniques uh-huh. that I kind of looked into a little mm-hmm. bit, just really, Um, I remember when I was having contractions, I was able to, even if I was really tense in my upper body, Mm -hmm. like gripping the railings or needing to just feel tense in my arms, Mm -hmm. I was really focused on just staying relaxed Mm -hmm. from the waist down. Mm -hmm. And somehow I do feel like I was able to, to do that Mm -hmm. throughout most of the contractions. I think that helped it. I did dilate pretty quick, um, once I went into active labor, I don't know if that had anything to do with it, sure. but just sort of, sort of just my breathing techniques is, yeah. is what helped. Okay. Okay. All right. And yeah, people don't realize it's really hard, or I should say people don't necessarily understand like how powerful breathing can be in terms of helping you manage things that come up in your, in your life. Really. It's really hard to like stay tense if you're focused on relaxing your you're breathing. It's mm-hmm. hard to keep those two energies together. So breathing is a really powerful and important thing that I think is underutilized for sure. Yeah. 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 It helped. 
As an OBGYN and podcast host, I'm excited to share a resource that empowers mothers and mothers-to-be in managing their pelvic floor and core health. It's called Informed Pregnancy Plus, and it offers access to essential workshops that can significantly enhance your understanding and care of your body during and after pregnancy. Discover the Core Connection, a foundational five-episode series by Natalie Headings, a pre-postnatal exercise specialist. This series covers the basics of pelvic floor health, teaches key postural adjustments, and shows you how to activate your core properly. For a more comprehensive experience, check out Mindful Movement. This premium series provides in-depth content, including practical exercises and personalized strategies to strengthen your body. It's like having a pelvic health expert in your home. You can try the full subscription streaming library of Informed Pregnancy Plus absolutely free. Visit informedpregnancy.tv to start an empowered journey toward a healthier motherhood. Take this step for your health, your body, and your baby will thank you. Let's get into what was your labor and birth like? So how did everything go? So we... I guess I should start by just saying yeah. like a little bit about how things work here on Maui because it might uh-huh. be a little different, you know, oh, yeah, in a absolutely. lot of the, um, yeah, in a lot of the podcasts I heard, you know, moms, like when it came time to pick which hospital they wanted to go to, mm-hmm. just trying to see which hospitals offered, you know, what type of interventions mm-hmm. and like here on Maui, we only have one hospital. Okay. So it kind of took a lot of the, like I knew where I was going to deliver. There was gotcha. no, there was no alternative. Gotcha. Um, And then the hospital is an hour from where we live. So just kind of keeping that into the equation too, knowing Uh that, you know, we would have at least an hour drive to get in there. Gotcha. Yeah. So did you, well, how did that, I mean, were you scared? Were you, I mean, obviously that's, that's, you're not the only person who gives birth there. So it's a, it's, you know, so people are sort of used to it, but still like, how does it make you feel like I got a whole hour before I'm yeah. going to get to where I need to go? I felt like, cause it was my first, I knew maybe I would have a little bit more time. Uh-huh. Um, I do know people who live in the area where I do, who went to the fire station and didn't make it to the, oh, to the hospital and okay. gave birth over here. Okay. So I, <laughs> I have heard at least two stories of people not making it, uh-huh. but I know it's, you know, a lot of people have like an hour commute, sure. probably t- commute or drive yeah. to the hospital. Yeah. I know yeah. it's not uncommon, but it was just something in my mind, like, you know, having to prepare for that. And then just knowing that I might be having, you know, really intense contractions in the car sure. for an hour and not mm-hmm. really being able to move around. So that kind of made me a little nervous, but it wound up being okay. Like the drive wasn't, wasn't an issue at all. Okay. Yeah. And so I, um, I was due on a Friday and like I said, I went to that appointment where they were really forced, you know, trying to push me to get induced that mm-hmm. day. I didn't. I wasn't dilated at all at that time. I wasn't having any sort of Braxton Hicks at that time or any contractions. And then that Sunday night, probably around like 11 or 12 midnight, I started feeling contractions. Okay. But they weren't, you know, they would maybe come every anywhere from five to 20 minutes. Okay. So I knew they weren't regular. And some of them felt intense, but some of them I could, you know, rest sort of comfortably through. Right. So, you know, I didn't wake up my partner at that time. I just figure, let him sleep. Mm-hmm. I was up pretty much that whole night, though. Mm. I don't think I slept at all. Okay. Um, and so then Monday morning came, and you know, I told him that I had been awake all night, having contractions, and I called my doctor, uh-huh. and they said, "Why don't you, you know, come in and get checked, and we'll see how things are going." Okay. So, um. I went in and got checked again, our, our drive. Right. Um, and I was dilated. She said I wasn't really dilated at all, but like when she did the check, I kind of like, like she almost dilated me to a centimeter. Okay. Like, I, I don't know. No. She said you were like right there and yeah. then she did the check and it kind of like opened up a little bit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but really not dilated at all. Okay. Um, and so they did, um, an NST. Uh-huh. Is that what it, Yep. And like everything was okay with the heart rate and everything. And so she said, like, basically just go home and act like you're 35 weeks pregnant because you could still go like this for days. Okay. You know, we don't really know. Right. So that was a little disheartening because I was still having contractions Uh and I was not hoping to (laughs) still have days like that. But we went home. Did she offer you the option to stay and be... 
no. like induced or anything like that? Nope. No. Not okay. at that point. Okay. They pretty much, and I don't even think I saw a doctor at that visit. Okay. I think I just saw a nurse. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's probably why. Cause I'm guessing a doctor would have <laughs> maybe said, just, yeah, mm-hmm, just try to stay and be induced, but yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So that makes sense. Okay. So you ended up mm-hmm. going home. We ended up going home. Um, same thing all that night. So this is Monday night now mm-hmm. had contractions. They felt a lot worse at night. I don't know if that's a thing or if For it was maybe people, just cause yeah. you're not distract. I wasn't distracted by right. anything. So again, Monday night had contractions most of the night and then Tuesday, just stayed at home or stayed close to home. Mm-hmm. We went to the beach that day, just tried to kind of relax. And then Tuesday night or Tuesday evening, like around five o'clock is when I could tell the contractions were becoming more intense, okay. um, closer together. Right. I was using a contraction timer. So I knew, okay, we're looking at like now they're consistently every five minutes. Gotcha. So kind of felt like Tuesday night is when Things yeah. really. It became yeah. real. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're yeah. like, okay, here, now this is what they meant when they said that things were yes. going to be intense. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So when did you go back to the hospital? So we went back to the hospital Tuesday night around nine. I called the nurse and spoke with her, told her what's going on. Mm-hmm. She told me to come in and and then we got to the hospital maybe between nine and 10 okay. on Tuesday night. And, and then when they checked me in, I was already dilated to a six. Okay. All right. So that was reassuring. Yeah. I was like, okay. This is something now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then it was like, all right, it's go time. Yes. And then what happened from there? Um, so they hooked me up to the toco, to the monitor, um, started my IV, mm-hmm. and then just kind of had me relax for a little bit. Like I said, she checked me. I was a six. I, my water still hadn't broken. Okay. But she just, the nurse just kind of left and let me do my thing in mm-hmm. the room. Mm-hmm. Um, the doctor came in shortly after and offered me an epidural. I told him, you know, I wasn't really interested in it. Mm-hmm. He said, the anesthesiologist is here, you know, on the floor. We can do it now. I said, no, I'm okay. Right. And so I did ask the nurse, I think, shortly after that, if I could take the monitor off mm-hmm. and walk around a little bit. Mm-hmm. And she told me that because my son's something with his heart rate. Okay. She really didn't feel comfortable having me not on the monitor. Okay. And then they gave me, because of his heart rate, she did wind up giving me some fluids okay. at that time. Okay. Um, like a, like a liter of fluids uh-huh. just to try to, I'm not really sure, you know, what, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so she gave me some fluids in my IV and just told me I needed to stay hooked up to the monitor. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So then how did things progress from there? Um, uh, and I guess I should say, could you at least like, did you have... Any mobility in the room? It, to me, it was really hard. I mean, with the monitor on, I couldn't get out of the bed. I guess I, I don't know if I could have. To me, the monitor was really was uncomfortable just, because even even if I would just try to shift, you mm-hmm. know, those bands would just go into the wrong position. Right. And so I really, like, honestly, from the second I got to the hospital and I was in the bed, mm-hmm. I did not leave that bed until my son was delivered. I never once got up and walked the hallway or used the bathroom or anything. Okay. Okay. I was in the bed the whole time. Okay. All right. That was tough when you're trying to manage labor without medication, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, I mean, I was able to shift. I remember she kept having me go like position me on my side. Uh I think because he was having like frequent decelerations Uh with each contraction. Uh So she kept trying to like do position changes with me, but right. I, yeah, it was hard just to be in the bed sure. okay. the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did they offer for you to like maybe sit on a birthing ball or anything like that? Nope. No. Okay. Nope. Ugh, that's unfortunate. I feel like we have the peanut, uh-huh. what are called? The peanut. Yeah, the peanut. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. uh-huh. I think our hospital had those and maybe we had birthing balls too. I didn't see one in the room, but it was definitely never it was brought never up offered. or anything. Okay. Nope. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's tough. So, yeah. so then how did things um, proceed after that? So I think because of his, again, they just kept mentioning his heart rate as being concerning. Mm-hmm. And so the doctor came back in the room and he, he wanted to break my water to try to get the birth going, okay. to try to speed things up. Uh-huh. He said, we really need to work on like, we need to work on getting this baby out. Okay. So, um, 
let's, let's break your water. And which I agreed to, I said, okay, okay. you know, I'm okay with that. Right. So he did. And I don't really remember the contractions or anything changing that much okay. after he broke my water. Okay. And how long had you been there when he, I want to say maybe like two hours. Okay. Okay. You know, it gets kind of, but yeah, sure. I would think maybe Roughly. two hours. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And had you dilated more at that time? I was still a six okay. as far as I know. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Or maybe I, yeah. Yeah, okay. He didn't mention anything about that, but okay. he broke my water. Uh-huh. Um, and then he did offer me an epidural again. Mm-hmm. And he explained to me, he said, you know, the way things are progressing, there is a chance that you're going to need a C-section. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you don't have an epidural, then you'd be looking at like general anesthesia, your partner, dad can't be in the room. Like we're looking at more of a surgery, surgery, right. where if we do an epidural for you now, and we do have to do a C-section, at least you can be like awake and Mm -hmm. dad can be in the room. Right. And that scared me because like I said, the C-section thing was always something I was really scared of and and general anesthesia, just, I don't know, the idea of it just really is is scary to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I still said no, I felt really pretty strongly about not having an epidural. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, I understand the risks of not, not getting it, but Mm -hmm. I'm but yeah, I declined it again. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So then yeah. what, how did things, and I should ask, had you gotten any sleep at all? No, not since like Saturday night, Okay, <laughs> probably. And I this, mean, I slept off and on Sure. maybe a little bit on Sunday night, maybe a little bit on Monday night, but now we're like into Tuesday, Tuesday right. at one in the morning. Uh-huh. So, cause I really did have like 48 hours of contractions mm-hmm. at home okay. before I even went to the hospital. Gotcha. Gotcha. Were you, did you feel, t- were you tired? Were I think you, just because of everything going just, on and the just, pain and the adrenaline. Yeah. I mean, you know, right. I just, I was in it gotcha. at that point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. So he broke your water and then what mm-hmm. happened after that? And then he left the room mm-hmm. and he kind of left me just to, you know, again, I was having contractions. I, I remember I was laying on my left side, just gripping the bed rail with both hands, just kind of riding out the contractions mm-hmm. with my partner in the room. And then I remember at one point, like when it came time to deliver the baby, Mm -hmm. like the lights were off and it was just the two of us in the room. Okay. And then all of a sudden, full lights came on in the room. Mm. And then the doctor, my nurse, and like, I don't know, probably a total of like eight people all just came in the room at once. And the doctor said to me, because they were watching something with the heart rate and he was Uh having frequent, I want to say late decelerations. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He said that they really needed to get the baby out like now. I don't know why. Okay. It became like a, and so it was kind of an intense moment because like I said, the lights were kind of dim and right. it was just the two of us. And, and then, then all, all of a sudden, sudden it was, was like, right. Everybody was there. Even the pedi- a pediatrician came in the room too. Right. So yeah. So he checked me and I was a nine and a half. Uh-huh. He said, you're not quite 10 centimeters, but you're going to start pushing. Okay. And so I was like, Okay. I, I was ready at that point. Right. And I remember the the way that he phrased it was actually like a it stuck with me because he said, you're going to curl up and around your baby and you're going to push down. And for whatever reason, that like that like clicked. It made Got sense it. to me what he was saying right. and like the way I needed to push. Right. And so I started pushing. And I don't know at what point during pushing mm-hmm. he told me I was going to need to have an episiotomy which was something that I really wanted to avoid, but I feel like it wasn't even a discussion at that point. There was no like, this is why you're going to need one or uh-huh. like even giving me the option to maybe decline it. He right. just was like, we have to get the baby out. And so I'm going to have to, this is what I'm going to have to do. And so I just kind of went along with it. And I was like, okay, you know, do what right. you got to do. So uh, do you know yeah. how long you have been pushing at this point? I don't think I was pushing for very long. I would say not an hour. Okay. Maybe an hour. Okay. Maybe an hour. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> and so then he says you needed, you know, he recommended an episiotomy, mm-hmm. but with no anesthesia. No anesthesia. No. I mean, he did a local, of course. Okay. Anesthetic, you know, like okay. I'm assuming he did because I didn't really feel it. So okay. I, I think he, I think he did a local. Okay. Okay. But still okay. he, you know, I had the episiotomy, which I, I really didn't want to have. But right. It happened. And then shortly after that, I kept pushing and everything. I mean, again, this is my first baby, so I don't know what's normal or not, but I just felt like the energy in the room was just so intense. I mean, I had like 
nurses, nurse aid, doctor, everybody was just like screaming at with me, at me with each contraction, like to get the baby out. Right. And I don't know if it was, he did wind up having the cord wrapped around his neck twice. Okay. So I'm not sure if that's why it became like what felt like an emergent situation. Right. So the episiotomy happened and then the doctor ended up having to use forceps for my delivery for pretty much, I mean, it felt like he started using them early on in the contractions. And so that part was just, ugh, it was just awful. Forceps delivery without any pain meds is, it was, it was pretty bad. It was really painful. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What did he say? Why? I mean, was it just, we just need to get it, the baby delivered? It all came, it always felt like it all came back to his heart rate uh-huh. and that we needed to get the baby delivered to avoid a C-section. Okay. But it, to me, that was like always the conversation that right. was, right. that was my understanding. Sure. Yeah. But it just felt like so, there was just so much pressure for me to push him out and get him out. And then, like I said, the forceps was just, I mean, he used them, I, you know, I, with each contraction, I would, I would push three times. Uh-huh. And so it felt like with each contraction, he was using the forceps because I could feel what felt like just being ripped apart. Honestly, <laughs> it was very, very painful. Okay. So do you know, like, when he mentioned the forceps and when he mentioned the episiotomy, like which one came? The episiotomy, definitely. He mentioned it first. Okay. Just to create more space, I think was kind of what he said, Uh like create more space to Uh get the baby out. Uh And then the forceps was like mentioned, but again, I feel like everything just was happening so fast that I didn't really get to like ask if it was really necessary. I just felt like there was a lot of like I said, like pressure for right. me to right. get the baby out. Right. Okay. Sometimes I have to wonder because there, one of the nurses at one point came in and I heard her kind of giving the doc like, like a little report on the side uh-huh. that they had gotten another call that a mom was coming in and she was either a scheduled C-section or they knew she was going to be a C-section. So I don't want to think this of the team, but I'm like, I wonder if knowing that some, like another mom was coming in, if he was the only doctor on call, did they try to like quick, you know, Mm -hmm. really hurry up my delivery? Right. 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 I don't know. You know, that's just. Yeah. I mean, you hate to think that, but yeah. uh, uh, Oh goodness. Okay. So then, I mean, typically we only use forceps over about three contractions. I mean, at the most. Oh, so yeah. So, um, I don't know. It, it's just hard to say what happened in your own situation mm-hmm. without seeing, you know, but do you, but you felt like it was, I felt like he used them with each contraction. Okay. I think so. Again, hard to say because yeah. it was just, and now I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask my partner then if he remembers, because yeah. he said it was just, yeah, kind of shocking for him too, to see the forceps and uh-huh. I don't know uh-huh. how they're being used. Was this an older doctor or? No, he was, he was a younger doctor. Okay. Um, it is interesting though, because my postpartum nurse said that of the care team, you know, the eight Kaiser doctors, uh-huh. he is really the only one who uses that, who he's ever seen use forceps. Okay. I was scared to say, cause not a lot of people use forceps so much anymore. And mm-hmm. yeah. And that's what, then when I saw like my the doctor I saw postpartum was not the doctor who delivered my baby. Uh-huh. It was a different doctor who had right. come on at that point. Right. And she told me too that she doesn't use them. Um, she said that it's really because a lot of doctors don't feel comfortable yeah. with it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it, and she said, you know, the doctor who delivered my son, he's, he feels comfortable and he can use it like an extension of his hand sure. was the phrase she used. Okay. But I still, I've never talked to anybody who's had none of my, friends or people I've talked with has right. had a forceps delivery. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's not most more doctors use vacuum as opposed to, to forceps. So I, I had that too, but I didn't know I had a vacuum until the day after like postpartum. Wait, the, the what? Postpartum. Yeah. He, he used the vacuum as well, but I had no idea that I had the vacuum at the end is what they said. How did you find that out? The doctor who came in and saw me <clears throat> the next morning 
she was like just telling me a little bit about the birth. And she said, you know, I see you're a surgical, she called it a surgical vaginal delivery. You had forceps and a vacuum. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that I had a vacuum. Nobody told me right. while I was giving birth. And I didn't feel that part of it. I don't know. But yeah, that that never came up in the delivery room. And then my my partner, he said, he was like, oh yeah, yeah, they did use that like at the very end just to to bring him out all the way. But I didn't know. Okay. They never asked me about that. <laughs> right. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's unusual to use both. Um, Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's not typical. I mean, that would be like it, it, doing a C-section at that point would be extremely difficult. So uh, sometimes we get into the decision of, you know, what's the best thing if the heart rate's down to get the baby out. So maybe, obviously I can't Monday morning quarterback what happened, but sure, sure. just definitely interesting. Okay. So baby comes out and you said he had a, a Nuchal cord twice, Mm -hmm. you know, around his neck. But how did he look? Like, was he response? Like, I think he was totally fine. Like, they because he had the the nuchal cord. Uh Um, I didn't get to do like delayed cord clamping Mm -hmm. or like have him on my chest right away. They pretty much just whisked him off to the corner where the pediatrician was. Mm -hmm. But he was totally fine. I mean. No concerns at all. Okay. His APGAR score was good. Okay. He was, okay. He was great. He was did, great. They, did they bring him back to you pretty quickly? Um, I'd say maybe 15 minutes. Okay. Or so. Not right away. It was not right away. Was he uh, like screaming or was he like, or did mm, it take was, a bit for him to cry? Or No, no, no. He was crying. I mean, maybe not like right away, uh-huh. but within the first minute he was crying. I could hear him. Right. Yeah. So, but he didn't come back to me. Maybe it wasn't 15 minutes, yeah, but I feel still, like it was at least it was, 10. Okay. It was not like right. just a minute or two sure. that he was with the nurse sure. with, with them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I just wish, uh, uh, you know, we can resuscitate babies on mom's chest and that often yeah. helps. So we usually like to try and give it a chance on the mm-hmm. chest, but, um, well, that's a shame to you. Kind of hear that yeah, stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. It, but th- that it just goes to show just, you know, we kind of practice in like in silos and people, hospitals just sort of get used to the way they do things and not realizing yeah. that there's a different way that things can be done. So, yeah, especially if it's just the one hospital, they, they're not going to see a lot of different ways that you, it's very easy to get into your own thing. Not that anybody's trying to do anything wrong. It's just, you just sort of get used to doing what you do. This episode is sponsored by ByHeart. ByHeart is an infant nutrition company built from the ground up to deliver real innovation on behalf of babies and parents. Their mission is simple. Make the best formula in the world. Using the latest in breast milk science, ByHeart created a clinically proven, easy to digest infant formula that's made with organic grass-fed whole milk, certified clean ingredients, and features a patented protein blend that gets closest to breast milk. Their blend includes the most abundant protein found in breast milk, alpha-lac, as well as lactoferrin, the number one protein found in colostrum. In addition to its patented protein blend, their formula includes prebiotics and an 80-20 whey to casein ratio like in early breast milk, which is tailor-made for a newborn's digestive system and makes it an easy to digest formula. Curious about ByHeart? Redeem your welcome offer at byheart.com forward slash podcast with code Dr. Nicole for a limited time. Additional terms and conditions apply. Let's talk about what happened with the placenta because I know <laughs> it was more after that. So what happened with that? Yeah. So the short of it is, is that I didn't deliver the placenta, mm-hmm. um, even like with Pitocin. So I remember they brought my son back and he was on my chest mm-hmm. and the doctor told me that he was going to um, start working on my repair, which was took a long time. Okay. Um, he said, when I asked him how many stitches I had, he said, It's a lot. We don't count them because it's just a running stitch. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he said I had quite a few internal and external stitches. So he was working on the repair. Um, I had my son. And then my IV had failed. So they didn't give me Pitocin in the IV to kind of stimulate contractions. Mm -hmm. Um, 
for the placenta to come out. But they gave me um, I, an IM injection mm-hmm. of Pitocin. Right. And then nothing was really happening at that point. I think maybe like a little piece came out or okay. he tried to go up and like manually remove it. Right. But it wasn't it wasn't coming out. Okay. They didn't give me any more Pitocin, just that one injection. Okay. Um, and really, it's hard for me to tell how much time had passed. Sure. Maybe a half hour, uh-huh. at least, while he was working on the repair. And uh-huh. still, still, the placenta wasn't coming out. So he told me that he needed to manually remove it mm-hmm. or, like, essentially, like, mm-hmm. scrape it out, mm-hmm. which, um, again, after having you know, no pain meds at all, not even a Tylenol or anything. Right. Um, the forceps delivery, the episiotomy, and then he scraped essentially mm-hmm. the placenta out in like small pieces. And it took, I feel like that took at least an hour to do. Right. Cause it just, it, it just wasn't coming out. And so he would, he would like push really hard on right. the top of my stomach or on right. top, you know, top of yours, right. like be pushing and then using what my partner said looked like a back scratcher for lack of a better term. He said this, it's, the thing looked like a back scratcher. It's, that called, he, a, I, he, it's called a banjo curette. Oh. It's a, oh, yeah, okay. I, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, um, it was pretty painful. That actually was almost just as painful as delivering my son just because I think of all the trauma that had happened down there. Right. And at that point, I didn't have the adrenaline on board. Like I wasn't, my son was here and he was fine. So right. I was just, I was just feeling everything so, so much more. And it came out like, I was kind of looking forward to like seeing my placenta and this, right. you know, nice, beautiful presentation. And right. I mean, it just came out in like little inch pieces kind of, Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. It's painful. Okay. Did they offer you pain medicine? <laughs> no, I think she gave me um maybe an Advil or something like that. They offered me at that point. Um Yeah, I definitely they didn't offer me anything like stronger IV. They did start a new IV on me and just kind of, you know, hep locked it, but uh-huh. um yeah, they didn't they didn't offer me anything else. And I didn't ask. You know, I I pro- I know I could have asked for something. Right. Um, but I didn't cause I felt like, like I was handling it. Okay. But in uh-huh. hindsight, just with all the pain that I had like postpartum, uh-huh. um, I feel like it could have maybe helped at least, you know, for those next 24 hours being in the hospital, sure. like it really, the pain just, it lasted. I can imagine. Yeah. So then once everything was settled, then what? What what was the postpartum period like for you? Um, postpartum, I mean, we, you know, we stayed in the hospital for your standard, you know, I guess one night, one extra night. Okay. Um, and then we were discharged. You know, I, I would have really loved to have had the opportunity to talk to my doctor who did my delivery again. And right. like I said, it was just so unfortunate that the next morning I saw a different, a different doctor. because. Right. I was trying to ask her questions. Like I wanted to hear about actually what happened and what interventions I had and the reason why we did all this stuff. And she didn't really, I mean, she didn't really know much of the details. At one point she was like, I'm going to go get the computer and bring it in the room so I can actually try to explain things. So I just didn't feel like I got good closure um, in that way. Um, But we stayed in the hospital for, for, 24 hours. Sorry, there's a dog barking no, that's outside. Okay. I can probably hear him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just had a lot of pain, like a lot of a lot of vaginal pain for for weeks, months mm-hmm. actually after after birth. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Okay. So did you ever see like a physical therapist or anything or no, and I almost wish that I would have. Mm-hmm. Um again, it's like 15 months sure. out now. Right. So but when I went back for my six week visit, the mm-hmm. doctor said that I still wasn't healed mm-hmm. um, at that point, you know, told me, but I, he never recommended that I come back. So I didn't, I never went back after six weeks. Okay. But yeah, I feel like because I still have a little bit of like, not pain down there, but uh-huh. some, it's, it's still not quite right. Right. So I think seeing like a physical therapist or a physiotherapist mm-hmm. yeah. maybe would have been, a good thing for me right. to advocate more right. for myself. Right. 
Right. Yeah. So how, how are you feeling? I mean, this, I mean, it just, how are you feeling? If it, just looking at you, it feels like it was a lot and thinking back, it feels like it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot. Um, of course I wish things would have went different. Mm-hmm. I wish I would know because, because like I said, like this is my first baby and right. I don't, like I wish I would know what was normal mm-hmm. interventions or actions to take based on what was happening mm-hmm. with my son. Because, mm-hmm. you know, talking to some people, they're like, I don't know if this is if doctors are able to like try to uh, try to undo the nuchal cord while the baby's still in the birth. Yeah, center. no, I that we can't, yeah, we can't reach. You it, can't so. do okay. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah, so Mm-mm. I've heard that. I've heard just like a lot of like, well, they should have done this or they could have done that. Right. And, and I don't know what's what could have been possible or right. what could have been avoided. In the moment, I just was just kind of going for it because they may, I just felt like there was so much pressure to get my baby out. Like something was going to be really wrong with him. He right. was going to, you know, so it was like, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And there was no real discussion about it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in hindsight, I wish I would have felt like I had the opportunity to, to maybe ask more questions. Right, right. Right. Maybe I've avoided some of this, yeah, or some of some yeah. what happened. Yeah. So then, how do you how do you feel about your birth experience? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, my son was healthy mm-hmm. and and he was great. So I, you know, to me, that was the most important piece. Uh-huh. That was the most important part, of course. Right. Um. You know, I went in it with what I wanted, things that I wanted to see how I wanted it to go. But like I said, I was very open and very flexible to being like, okay, you know, it it might not be perfect and it might not go the way I want to. Sure. So I don't really hold on to, um, I don't know. I don't really hold on to much from what happened. Uh It's more like, I just want to know if what happened was normal. Right. (laughs) Like just because I, nobody that I've talked to felt like they had to have like, and especially the forceps. I mean, I don't want to be dramatic, but they really, really hurt. Yeah. And it just felt really, um, yeah. Yeah. I, like maybe maybe it could have been avoided, I, I guess. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And I should ask, did you breastfeed? Yes. Okay. How did I'm that- I'm still breastfeeding. Oh, okay. Well, then that went well then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. at least that, it doesn't sound like it mm-hmm. interfered with you being able to breastfeed. Yeah. No, no. He's, okay. All that was normal right from the get-go. Uh-huh. He, he latched on real good. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then what is, you know, as we end here, what is your one favorite, what is your one piece of advice that you will want to give to someone who's about to have a baby? I guess it's just like feeling comfortable being able to speak up Mm -hmm. for yourself. Um, And if you don't feel comfortable, you know, maybe having a doula or some sort of a support person that can do that. Right. You know, I felt really comfortable and confident being able to advocate for myself and speak up for what I wanted um, for me and for my son. And then when it came down to it in that moment, you know, even just having somebody that could help me ask the questions that I couldn't ask when Mm -hmm. everything got so intense, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. it could have been really helpful, I think. So just, you know, just knowing that even if you think you got it and you're like, you know, the type of person that can usually handle things on your own and, and, this might be one of those cases where it's good to always have someone else who can help you. Sure. Help you speak up. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know you said that you're not very active on social media. So mm-hmm. if anybody wants to reach out to you afterwards, you guys can reach out to us and then we can connect you with, with Jody. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then I just want to say thank you for coming on yeah. to share your story. Cause it's, I, I, I mean, it brings up so many points and like things that are going through my <laughs> head and thinking about, and I'm yeah. glad everything turned out okay, but that was a lot. Yeah. 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 No, thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful to be able to talk with you. All right. Wasn't that something in that episode? I so appreciate Jody coming to share her story on. Again, that was really difficult and challenging to hear. And I appreciate her having the strength and courage to come share that with us. Now, after every episode, when I have a guest on, I do something called Dr. Nicole's Notes. And here are my Dr. Nicole's Notes from my conversation with Jody. I do want to say that 
Rural and remote medicine and particularly labor and birth can be very challenging, actually. I do want to make some space for that. They're often doing a lot in trying to serve communities without the same level of resources as bigger places. As a result, more and more rural places are closing because they can't keep up. And unfortunately, it's leaving people without options. Now, when you don't have a lot of options, either for your doctor or for the hospital because of where you are located, there are a couple things that are really important. One is education. Education is gonna be so, so important so you are able and ready and informed to advocate for yourself. You can do an online childbirth education like my online childbirth education class, the birth preparation course. Um, That's a great option when you don't have a lot of options around you. You can check out the birth preparation course at drnicolerankins.com forward slash enroll. And if you use the code Dr. Nicole, you can get 10% off. But education is going to also potentially include um, reading books or it's going to include listening to podcasts or some sort of other combination of things so that you're really informed going into your birth experience. That's going to be crucial. Another thing that's going to be really, really important when you don't have options is understanding what you're getting into and asking those questions. Again, I talk about that um, in the birth preparation course and then also in my birth plan class as well. But having a doula or an advocate, someone who is with you who can help advocate for you if need be, also may be really, really, really important so that you have that extra layer of support when you don't have other options. In episode 218 of the podcast, that's drnicolerankins.com forward slash episode 218. I go through a step-by-step process to help you choose a doula, including asking if they feel comfortable advocating for you and some strategies to help you get a doula, if you have some financial restrictions, all of that great stuff. The last thing I want to say is how sometimes in OBGYN, we undertreat pain And it's something that is becoming more and more prevalent because of people sharing their experiences on social media. But there's definitely some element of kind of like tough it out, go through the pain without offering adequate pain medication for procedures. Something that's on social media that has gotten a lot of attention is IUD placement, so intrauterine device placement, and how some people have had very painful experiences with that and felt like they haven't been offered adequate pain medication for that. In general, I think we just don't necessarily take the pain of women seriously. And if you're from a marginalized community, uh, like a black person, or a woman of color, then that can be even more of a problem that your pain isn't taken seriously. Jody absolutely should have been offered more pain medication or even going to the operating room to help get that placenta out. She should not have had to endure an hour of trying to get this placenta without adequate pain medication on board. That just is absolutely unacceptable. Now, I will say in my own experience, I have had to try and quickly remove a placenta or address bleeding and remove clots from the uterus without pain medication or as pain medication is being administered. Generally, my process is that I'm going to I'm going to say like this is going to be painful, this is going to hurt, but it's not going to take long. So do you want me to give you pain medicine to get through it? Or do you want to just go ahead and it'll take a few seconds and we'll get it done? So I offer people that option. Now, there are some circumstances where even waiting for the pain medication isn't safe because there's so much bleeding that we need to get it under control right away. And in that case, I'm very much so explaining, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, this is gonna be uncomfortable, I'm so sorry, but I have to do this because the bleeding is so severe, I need to get this done because this bleeding is too heavy and it's getting life-threatening. So I communicate that as clearly as I can to the woman, to the family, so they understand what's going on. And then we get pain medication as soon as possible. 
Definitely, if I anticipate that things are going to be longer, if, or if I'm using any sort of surgical instruments, then I'm taking someone to the operating room in order to address like a placenta that isn't coming out. I'm not going to sit at the bedside and do that for so long because that's just that just breaks my heart that anyone would have to have that sort of experience. Okay, so there you have it. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to me right now. And I'd love it if you leave me an honest review in Apple Podcast. It helps other women to find the show. And it also helps me to hear what you think about the show. I do read all those reviews and I love to hear what you think. And I do shout outs from from those reviews from time to time. Also, please come join me in my live free class. Make a birth plan the right way. You are going to love it, love it, love it. It is jam-packed with information. And at the end, I stay for about half an hour and do a Q&A where I will answer any of your questions about pregnancy and birth. So it's a great way for us to connect outside the podcast. You can sign up for that at drnicolerankins.com forward slash birth plan. So that's it for this episode. Do come on back next week and remember that you deserve a beautiful pregnancy and birth.